Hello and welcome back to Board Game TV and this is my continuation of my Ravenloft Retrospect Part 2. I like to call it the Golden Age. It's basically from 1994, uh, it's about 97, 98, somewhere around there. Um, this is my favorite age and I think it's probably the best age of Ravenloft here. They cranked out a lot of products. They have a few missteps but mostly some really good stuff. Ironically, the Golden Age starts with a misstep with the red box set from Ravenloft. <clears throat> now, um, when you have to basically redo <laughs> a box set of rules four years after the original, it's not really a good sign. But I saw, I kind of see what they were doing. So it basically says that uh, this new edition of Ravenloft game combines the original Realm of Terror box set with new elements from forbidden lore and updated rules from other accessories. Domains destroyed in the famous Grand Conjunction have been deleted, new domains added, and key personalities detailed. This box set includes Realm of Terror, 160 page book of rules concerning the reshaping of character classes, fear, horror, madness, power checks, curses, spells, and magical items both new and old, psionics, techniques of terror, and more. Domain and Denizens, a 128-page book describing the Dark Lands of the Core, the Islands of Terror, and many, many nefarious personages. Two maps depicting the reshaped core domains in the Island of Terror. A poster featuring a painting by artist Rob Ruffell, or however you pronounce the name. A Taroka deck, a beautifully illustrated cards, role-playing force and telling, and a DM screen specifically designed for be used with the Ravenloft campaign. It was 30 bucks. Now, basically what this set was is just a reprint <laughs> mostly and I'm talking about almost word-for-word -word reprint of the original Ravenloft black box set however it also included uh, the forbidden lore the stuff that was in forbidden lore the stuff that was in all the Van Retchen guides <laughs> and basically uh, updated the timeline to include all the events that had happened in the novels and the modules. So it was basically a rules that included summaries or little tidbits about all the stuff that had happened in all the existing prior Ravenloft products before this. Now the two maps as you can see Here's our map of the core, and it's a very different type map, and I, I really don't like it. It's not as cool looking as the other one. But as you can see, there's a big shadow rift here. Many domains that were part of the core, thanks to the Grand Conjunction, have been removed. Some new ones have been added. Markovia's been moved here. Um, Arkendale is gone. Um, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> and the 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 core domain has has been reshaped, and then the islands of terror have come along. You see, they've added some new ones, but they changed part on to Teresa. They added Dominia here, and Gehenna, which was once part of the core, is now here. Bluespurt, which was part of the core, is now here, and so on. Um, the reason behind this was because they didn't want the core to be so um, I guess to have kind of almost an even same ge uh, geography they didn't want a desert land or a wasteland next to a land that had forest and you know less green forest and stuff like that so that is why they rearranged a lot of the stuff stuff that just didn't fit uh, you know with their climate and stuff like that it didn't make sense and then you know the, they retweaked some things like Markovia is basically the island of Dr. Moreau so so it wouldn't be good to basically be that here in the middle of the core they moved it there and uh, stuff like that now this map will change in future products however was the red box worth it well if you didn't have the original, if you were a newcomer 
and you didn't have the original black box set, then yes, it was worth it because it had what was in the black box and all products at least got somewhat of a mention. And the domain lords and their domains are more detailed in this set than they were in the original. And then it came with a Taroka deck and, um, and that kind of good stuff. But honestly, if you had already had the black box, there was no point in getting this. Other than the only thing that would be useful was that if you were going by the new timeline after the events of the Grand Conjunction, um, which one of the good things about this is in Ravenloft is, is that it did do that. It updated the timeline and and now a new campaign starts a few years down from when your original campaign started because it took a couple years for all those modules that originally happened and for the Grand Conjunction to take place. So it's basically saying, hey, you had an old group, you, this old group had a campaign in Ravenloft, they were running around for years, a big event happened, now you got a new group here, okay, uh, this is the timeline, the effects of that have taken place, the domains are a little different and reshaped. And the big mystery was, what's well, the Shadow Rift? They didn't tell you what the Shadow Rift was, that was the big mystery for this. And... <clears throat> um, Added a new few things like Roshima Teo or Teo or however you pronounce it to kind of fit a Oriental type thing. Uh, the Nightmare Lands they really didn't go into that either as much. Uh, very brief, but it's it's kind of like a Freddy Krueger type thing. And Dominia, who was uh, Doctor Domini from Feast of Goblins, well he's finally got his own domain now. And he, this is his domain. Being a uh, person who had all the products, this really wasn't worth it for me. It was a disappointment. <clears throat> I really have to say, it was a disappointment. Because I had everything. I had all the rules, updates, and stuff. And, you know, it, it was just, you know, <laughs> you could have had a big box set for something else. However, if you were a newcomer, yeah, get it. It's it's worth it. Um, but if you were a newcomer and you wanted to play some of the older stuff, it kind of some of the older stuff kind of felt a little out of place. And also, for whatever reason, I don't I don't know. This maybe is a personal opinion of mine, but the black box has a certain charm to it. That when you read it, it just has a certain charm to it, and this kind of lacks that chart charm and harm to it for whatever reason I don't know uh, that's just my own personal opinion but to me this was a kind of a misstep coming out the gate um, and the red box has been maligned a lot as not being as good as the original black box even though it contains more information because it, it just basically summarizes a few things about each product or mentions a, a product here or there and the events that happen but the main great thing about this is that it ups the timeline acknowledges that everything that you can play through in the first from 1990 to 1994 it happened and the world has gone on and even including the novels and um, you know the the campaign the the realm the domain is a little bit more cohesive it's not just like hodgepodge of one horror archetype here one horror archetype there it's now a little bit more cohesive, okay? It's a lot more uh, organized and makes sense uh, because you see here, this is a lot of tropical, and then this here, it kind of goes off into grasslands and stuff where it used to be in the middle of the thing. You had like a barren, rocky, Grand Canyons desert type domain, and it just didn't fit. Also, uh, another good thing about this is it started hinting to, hey, no more weaken of horrors. Make your characters from Ravenloft. I mean, they had kind of started going that way a little bit in some of the later products from the first era. But th this really starts to home in on that. Look, make your characters no more weaken of horror stuff. You can still do weaken of horror stuff if you want. But make your characters, try to, let's, let's 
here's some personalities of the people who live in these play in these in these lands. Make your characters a little bit more like that. We have a C now on this side, so you, you know all types to choose from. But to me, the the red box was a miss. It was a disappointment. The next thing we're going to come over is the, and as you can see, I have a lot of wear and tear. Is the third monsters compendium for Ravenloft. No more. They got out. They stopped doing the compendium format I loved of the binder and the hole punch sheets that you put in and just went back to like a book type and honestly I didn't care for that I don't like the book type sorry I just don't but also um, I just thought some of these monsters in here just weren't as good so um, this and you know it has a lot of monsters that had already shown up in other products like the Death's Head Tree, the Carrionette, stuff like that, Greater Animator, and it's just stuff like that. And honestly, a lot of the monsters that are new and everything are kind of boring. And so I did not think this was a good product either. It was another misstep for me. Um, I, but I am biased because it's lost the format that I loved so much. Now we stop getting out of the missteps. And we start getting into the good stuff. And here we go. Ravenloft when Black Roses Bloom, level 4 through 6. The nightbound realm of Scythicus is dying. The gray forest of crags scarred by jagged wrists echo with the limits of dying elven nation. But the lord of the land sits in carrying on its blackened throne in the charred castle of Ned Regard. Lost in ancient memories. Though his passion and hatred, the nightmare haunted death knight. Lord Soth permitted catastrophe to befall his native world of Kryn. Now trapped in the realm of terror, Soth has once more brought calamity to his home. Abandoning the rule of his twisted realm of Scythicus, Lord Soth has retreated to a still more distorted domain, the mad fantasies of his own history. To save the land and themselves, the heroes must venture into Banshee-haunted Nedregard Keep and into the warped mindscapes of a tormented Dark Lord. The history of the greatest villain of the Dragonlance saga is at last revealed in the realm of terror for fans of Dragonlance and Ravenloft adventures alike. Alright, this grand adventure is suited for four to six player character levels of four through six. No prior knowledge of Kryn is necessary or Dragonlance Saga is necessary. And it's not. But it helps. It's good. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this module. You know, uh, Lord Soth, really, I knew his history, but him and his domain really weren't detailed um, because at the end of one of my favorite books, Night of the Black Rose there, he ends up getting his domain and it kind of is like a mirror of his homeland in Kryn, but he, everything's a little out of whack. Like his castle is looks the same, but it's not really the same. It's not, it's like different in some areas. And his he's cursed by these, you know, have these banshees sing his betrayal song all the time, and but they sing it a little differently. So, the domain screws with him. So basically, the plot of this module is Soth, he doesn't care to be a ruler of the domain anymore. He's just abandoning it. And he, he ends up having these magical mirrors that he had commissioned. And they each uh, show a part of his history or past. And he's kind of like gone into the mirrors. His mind has, his body's just still sitting on the throne, but his mind has. And he's reliving his past, uh, different past experiences over and over again, but he's doing them differently. He's changing them to where things worked out for the benefit of him. And he was the hero he always should have been instead of turning evil. And he, by doing this, his land is starting to crumble, which is, is down here. It's starting to crumble and fall apart. And a lot of the characters from Night of the Black Rose like the gypsy girl, uh, I forget her name, and Azazel or Azrael, whatever his name is, the wear badger guy that became essential. They're all in this. And this details the land very good, which we needed. We needed a module to detail Sithicus, or Sithicus, or however you pronounce it, 
we needed a, a module because it had not really been detailed at all. And when you got a villain as epic and as famous really as Lord Soth, uh, why the hell has he not appeared in an adventure yet in Ravenloft? You have one of the biggest names in Dra Dungeons and Dragons really here and he's been kind of ignored. So basically for that adventure what you have to do is you have to go to his castle because the, even the citizens of his realm and his realm is has his citizens are elves it's one of the only few really only realms of Ravenloft that have demi humans Ravenloft is basically an all human um, or at least the core is basically an all human all white uh, populace except for a few few areas but Sithicus is populated by elves, okay, and um, they're starting to lose their memories, the domain is falling apart, and so Azriel, I can't, I can't, what's his name, Azriel is Azazel, I, I can't remember which one it is, um, he's trying to get help to figure out what the hell is going on, and so you basically have to go and enter those mirrors and relive moments from his past but you have to make it back to how it was like he changes his memories to make it where he's the good guy and he wins all the time but you have to go back into the mirrors and make it to where what really happened where where he really he didn't he lost or he became evil or he did this and so it's a really interesting concept I think it messes up a few places on execution but it's a real interesting concept and anybody that's familiar or knows the Dragonlance thing uh, myth and everything or is familiar with it will love it because you go back and crin and you you know you end up fighting Tanis have Elvin one time and 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 it's it have the dragon wars and it's really climactic it's, it's not gothic horror okay this module is nowhere near gothic horror Okay, but Soth is not really a gothic horror. He comes from a fantasy, a dark fantasy uh, build, and so that's what this module really is. It's not pure dark gothic horror, and, and not every Ravenloft thing has to be gothic horror. <clears throat> and so you go in there and try to get that, and then by doing that for all these different memories, you end up, he ends up leaving and coming back to his physical body, and he's trying to straighten the realm out, and I don't want to give anything away, but you end up having to, uh, he goes to confront, um, we'll say a ghost from his past um, that's been plaguing him this whole time. And, you know, you, you end up kind of defeating him, but not destroying him. And so eventually he just goes back to, it goes back to status quo. But later on, which we'll see, Soth is one of the few lords to escape. Ravenloft, okay, because he, he later on when Weiss and Hickman uh, come back and, and and start up their Dragonlance series of novels again, they bring Soth back into those, so he can't stay in Ravenloft. He's got to go back, and so later on they they get rid of him. But for this adventure, it was a really great adventure. It does what it's supposed to do. Um, yeah, it has a few problems. It's a little fantasy heavy. But it details the land, details the people, and details the Lord, and you have a confrontation with them. Highly recommend it. Especially if you love Dragonlance. Highly recommend it. Next up is Van Richen's Guide to Fiends. Fiends? What's that? That's demons. Okay, before I read any of this, TSR, or Dungeons and Dragons, has always had a problem with being accused of being satanic or satanism associated with that now and you know that came up really a few years after D&D &D, you know started being published and starting to become popular and it, it, it had never really been able to shake that um, stigma which I think is bullshit Everybody I've ever played D and D with, none of them were Satanists. So I, I don't know. You get a few stupid people doing a few stupid things, 
and then everybody who played Dungeons and Dragons is labeled a Satanist or something. It's it's ridiculous. There's no I don't I don't I don't know I don't know what to say about that. I just think uh, it it's gotten that hard rap on that. So in the '90s, you, they couldn't have not have come out with Van Richen's Guide to Demons because oh my God, you know some crazy ass parent or some church group or something would have seen that and just would have boom exploded <laughs> and boy you know they're trying to make money they're trying to be a family friendly company believe it or not they put out all different kinds of products board games for kids Dungeons and Dragons different settings books the last thing they need is another big satanic uh, controversy so I do not fault them for doing that now in 2018 they could literally put Van Richen's Guide to Satan on the cover and pfft, nobody would bat an eye. Just goes to show how times have changed. Okay? But I just wanted a little word on that. But when they mean fiends, when they say fiends, that's what they mean, demons. Okay? So it says, Fiends have come forth from the abyss and into Ravenloft. Masters of deception and manipulation, these ancient evil beings stalk the lands, roaming freely in pursuit of their foul ends and warping the very land around them to suit their needs. Dr. Rudolph Van Richen has set himself on their trail and presents here his preliminary findings and theories on these beings from the places of unimaginable horror. Dr. Van Richen exposes the nature, origin, strengths, and weaknesses of the fiend and how it reaches the land of the mist. He explores the character of these beings and their connections to the people and the land itself. In the ultimate irony, these awesome creatures are as trapped by the land as any mortal seduced by prospects of power and glory. Beware the fiend, for those caught in the web of a fiendish plot, nothing is as it seems. To defeat a fiend, a quick wit and strong heart are more important than a strong arm or flashing blade. This is another really good Van Richen guide, and it's in the same thing as others. But, um, huh, it really, demons had not really been, with the exception of that one demon that Strahd had made a deal with and that you kind of team up with, in Roots of Evil, demons were kind of like a neglected uh, evil creature for Ravenloft. There really hadn't been any. And the thing, so they needed to discuss it and they and, and, and put them in here and it, they did a really good job with this book. And basically what this book goes on to say is that when demons are summoned by some stupid mortal in the Ravenloft, the demons are trapped. They cannot leave as powerful as they are, they can't leave Ravenloft either. Once they're here, they're stuck. And then this will end up, most, most of them will get infuriated because they can't stand it here. And that they're so evil and powerful, they warp the land around them. And uh, eventually, if they don't, um, <laughs> and if they keep being demons, they're going to end up getting their own domain. And they're just a force to be reckoned with. But there's, not many of them in, in the land of Ravenloft. And this book does a really good job of explaining that. He, our, our guy from Roots of Evil, you know, as you can see, he's right here. He makes an appearance um, and, you know, explains a little bit about it, uh, you know, how what the demons think of Ravenloft. But yeah, a really no, another really good book, uh, another really good Van Richen guide. I, I recommend it. It's a great book. Next comes Circle of Darkness. Circle of Darkness is another module, which I found excellent, detailing the domain of Gehenna and its Dark Lord. Now, Gehenna was a land of the core. After the Grand Conjunction, it got turned into an island of terror here, but originally it was a land of the core. Now, this module takes place when Gehenna is an island of terror. And Gehenna is basically a theocracy. It's run by a madman uh, who worships this beast god uh, and he has the whole populace worshiping the beast god and food is scarce and people, the population is starving and um, but him and his uh, Spanish Inquisition, that's basically kind of what this is off of this domain is off of is the Spanish Inquisition and the horrors it inflicts upon its populace and that's what this is. But Circle of Darkness 
the mist of Ravenloft lead to Gehenna, land of famine and zealous devotion to Yango Petrovna, the high priest of the beast god Zakata. In the cities of Gehenna, worshippers starve themselves to prove their faith. In the outlands, twisted mongrel men struggle to survive in a land of unforgiving windstorms and bleak plains. No domain in the demiplate of dread has been in greater need of change, and the subtle agents of the circle of darkness wish for nothing less than to overthrow their oppressive leader and create a new order led by Sakata himself. They should be careful what they wish for. Circle of Darkness is a dangerous adventure for heroes willing to face not only the Dark Lord of Gehenna, but also a greater evil which threatens to overcome him. The fate of an entire main domain is in the hero's hands. So this is a, another great module that um, really, and it comes with a, a good map. Uh, tape. I don't know how I've got tape on it. Um, that details the domain, which had not been detailed before, really. You know, I had a few brief words about it. And, here we go, see, Circle of Darkness, Temple of Zakata, some tables, and stuff like that. And it, it kind of, in a little bit of a way, it kind of reminds me of Isle of Dread, the old X1 module. <clears throat> if you know anything about what I'm talking about. Because you have a map and you have a lot of wilderness encounters, and you can go from one encounter to another encounter to another encounter, and then you end up, you know, doing the city thing and 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 do, and trying to do a dungeon crawl at the end and stuff like that. But basically, what Gehenna is is um, Yango Petrovo Petrovona. We'll just call him Yango from now on. Um, he was always a mentally unstable person. Always talking to himself, talking to things nobody else could see and stuff like that. And he was kind of like a maybe abused a little bit and just odd. So he imagined a, a beast god, um, basically, and started preaching that this beast god was real and everything. Of course, no, no, but nobody believed him. And he lived in Barovia, I think it was, when Barovia was still was in Ravenloft and it was early on, and. Uh, one day he, I think he kidnapped his sister's son, little baby. He's going to sacrifice it to the beast god that caught him. Uh, he ran and fled for his life into the mist, and boom, he was granted a domain. So, uh, what he does, he set up, you know, this beast god. The whole populace worships the beast god. The beast god is not a good, happy god. Uh, everybody's required to starve. Uh, Food is real scarce anyways, except for the priests and the inquisitors, which are always high going around asking people, uh, you know, to spy on people and, and try to find out about them, to find out if they're, they're hered heretics and stuff like that. And um, the domain is just a miserable, miserable domain. <laughs> and um, it's, just, it's just a horrible place starvation everywhere people are paranoid telling on each other they'll tell on their families stuff like that and they have to worship constantly the beast god well punishment for not doing this stuff is you get turned into a beast man and so the beast man live in the wild lands of the domain well anyways what happened was was Yango early on uh, conjured up a demon and uh, he was trying to get a hold of his imaginary beast god and there is no beast god and he conjured up a demon um, <laughs> and the demon uh, basically mocked him and all that stuff but the demon ended up remaining trapped in the place where Yango uh, summoned him so uh, basically what's happening is there's a people with inside his own church who are trying to overthrow him because they believe uh, the demon to be Zakara or whatever but the demon's lying to him and everything and at the end of the module basically you end up freeing Zakata and his demonic powers start to warp the land and people start turning into all kinds of monsters and he's going around killing everything and you end up having to end up you make a choice. You can team up with Ango to help stop the demon. You, you can not do anything and just let the demon win. 
and that kind of stuff. So how you play, what you decide at the end, decides what happens to the domain of Gehenna and the fate of it. And that's one great reason why it's such a, uh, it's better as an island of terror, because it's not on the core. So if, if you end up destroying both people, Yango and the demon, then Gehenna can just disappear into the mist and it never exists again. Although I think in canon, it, it does still exist. I think in canon what happens is you help Yango and defeat the demon, but Yango still rules the land, that kind of thing. It is another excellent top-notch module that I really love, full of deception, and just goes to show not all villains that are evil are monsters. Humanity can do just as much bad stuff with their uh, fanatic devotion to false gods and stuff like that. Really, really good module. Next up, we have A Light in the Belfry. Now, includes the interactive audio CD. It's a little mini box set. And you're going to see why in a second. Decades ago, the fair land of Avonlea was guarded by an order of paladins known as a Circle. One stormy night, a wizard named Morgoth came to seek refuge with them. But all was not as it seemed. Morgoth was no mere wizard. He was a necromancer on the run from a knightly brotherhood that had vowed to see him destroyed. When fate revealed his past, he betrayed the Circle and fled. Can your heroes complete the crusade that destroyed the Circle? Can they learn the secrets of Morgoth's power before the necromancer destroys them? Accept the quest if you dare. A Light in the Belfry is the first, and I'm going to add last, Ravenloft adventure to feature an interactive audio CD. As players explore Morgoth's dreadful manner, they will actually hear the lamentations of tortured spirits, the clash of swords, and the thunderous roar of magic. With almost 100 tracks of dialogue and sound effects and mood, music, TSR's interactive audio CD adventures add a new dimension to the horror of Ravenloft. Okay. You have to remember at this time, CD was really had and starting to take over as the main form of music over cassette tapes. Okay? Um, when Rave, uh, That's just the way it was. When Ravenloft first started, cassette tapes were a thing. CDs were now becoming something. And CDs have grown in popularity. Well, you know, <clears throat> how do you use CDs as a gimmicky way to sell products to make money and stuff like that? And that's what TSR tried. Now, Ravenloft was not the only product to get a CD adventure. I think a few other campaign settings did uh, get uh, a CD adventure. However, it wasn't too long after that that the CD adventure stuff stopped and they were never spoken of again. And <laughs> that is that. And um, they would have just forgotten about it. It was a nice try, but... <laughs> it wasn't really uh, it was it it didn't work out at all like they wanted because I, I guarantee you if this had been successful they'd have kept doing it so <clears throat> the module came with a good map on the a brand new and this was always something I was a bugaboo mind you got plenty of domains you never detailed and you want to come out with a new domain so we have the domain of Avonlea Okay, which is nobody lives there. It's got a crazy phantasmal forest type things where ghosts and spirits, and then in the middle of it is the Tarragon Manor, which is basically a haunted house filled with spirits. Now, Avonlea will become to be a major domain that connects with Shadowborn Manor, which was detailed in Dark Lords, where the Dark Lord of that was Evan Bane. And, oh man, what's the other domain? Uh, one of the domains in the source book, Islands of Terror. It would end up kind of beginning to cluster with those, which I'll explain that later. Um, but this was not just a one-shot domain. This domain became a part of Ravenloft and <clears throat> became part of its continuity. So what is really, what is wrong with this? Well... First of all, I'll say this. On the CD, the narrations, the sound effects, the music, they're all good. It's not cheesy like those old 1950s Halloween spectacular records, 
where you have some guy going boo hoo. Um, it's not like that. The sound effects are actually good. The problem is, is having the CD is pointless. Okay, when you're playing a Dungeons and Dragons game, you can play uh, a game, a Dungeons and Dragons game. Sometimes you'll have like background music playing, like for the final fight or something like that. Some music to really liven things up. But the way this thing uses a CD is, okay, you walk into room one, okay, play track one, and track one will describe what you see in room one. <laughs> okay, so, all right, now you walk into room two, play track two to describe what you see in room two. You don't need any of that. Just read the box text in the module for room two, and you got it. Unfortunately, they didn't do that. There is no box text to read, so you had to play the CD if you want to know what the hell was in that room. And basically, you're going in the house, you're looking for 12 shards of a mirror, and every time you find a shard of the mirror, you play a certain track, and it gives part of Morgoth's or whatever his name's history, and then once you find all 12 pieces and put them back together on the mirror, he, you, you play it all over again, and you, this time you hear his history in order, because the other times you would hear it when you just picked up a shard, be some random part of his history and you wouldn't know, well, I don't know what the hell happened you know and then you, you put it together and then you fight him he, he becomes alive and you fight him and you free the spirits in the haunted house when you beat him that's basically it um, believe it or not Ravenloft really hadn't had a good haunted house module and actually the core meat of this module is not bad the haunted house does have a good spooky haunted house feel to it. The lands surrounding it do have a good haunting surround to it. The story, the actual story and history of Morgoth and his betrayal of the circle after they took him in and everything because he loved a, a lady he couldn't have is actually a really good story. The problem is is the CD is pointless. There was no need for it. Okay, That's what brings this down. But other than that, the actual story, it's good. Now, there are transcripts you can print out on Secrets, uh, well, on Fraternity of Shadows. You, they have transcripts that you can print out of the narrations of what happens on what tracks. Okay, you just won't hear, like, the fighting sound effects and stuff like that and all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, you know, uh, who, who cares? I mean, really, honestly. Um, I, every time I've run this, except for the first time, when I used the CD, I just didn't use the CD anymore. I used the transcript. So I was like, ah, just forget about it. Because it's too much of a hassle. It really, just, honestly, is too much of a hassle to do all that and then DM and stuff like that. The problem was this was pointless. It didn't work. It doesn't go with Dungeons and & Dragons. And thankfully, TSR learned pretty quick not to do that anymore. But the actual story and part of the adventure itself is actually pretty good. Next up, we get Chilling Tales. Okay, Chilling Tales. Seven gripping settings. Haunted graveyards, manors and tombs, a bardic library with an unexpected room, ancient catacombs, and an entire town turned, into dark, turned to dark terror. Seven terrifying characters. Deadly and unexpected foes. A vampire who walks in the sun and laughs at clerics. A mummy whose touch turns living flesh water, and a fearsome host of others, a darkling, a vasilinch, a ghost, fiends, golems, a graveyard elemental, and a mad scientist. Seven nightmarish adventures. Dr. Rudolph Van Rich and Arthur of the Learned Van Rich and Guide summons player characters levels 3 to 9 to wipe out the evils that, that haunt Ravenloft. Throw your players with these seven chilling tales. Chilling tales is not that good. <laughs> Basically, it's Book of Crips but better but still not that good and the basic concept now the basic concept I think is actually a good idea you meet up with Rudolph Van Richen he's either in trouble from somebody from his past one of these monsters is trying to get him or you're on an adventure with him or it has some connection to him and it goes over all of his guides so you have your your vampire your werebeast your mummy such and such 
And that's basically what it is. It's a, it's a short little mini campaign adventure system to go with each of his guides. The problem in lies that most of the adventures are not that good. Through Darkened Eyes is not really that good. Although the guide to the Vistante had not come out yet, it was fixing to. So they included that in there. That's another one. Undying Justice, the Ghost, eh. Gazing into the Abyss, eh. Family Feud is two pages, okay? It's just an outline of what an, uh, the adventure should be. The Surge's Blade is, is really the best one on here because it, it deals with a figure from Van Richen's past and then a figure you will deal with again, Emil Bolenbach, I think. Ancient Dead is okay. Taskmaster Leech is alright. Scarlet Kiss is uh, it's meh. And <clears throat> it really... It really fails. And the reason why it fails, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, this book needed to be twice as big. If this book had been twice as big, um, then it really would have it would it could have been fantastic. It would have been knocked out of the park. Great thing, um, because I like the concept. Hey, Van Richen released a guide for each these different archetypes of monsters. Let's have an adventure focusing on each one of those archetypes, and let's put Van Richen in each of those adventures or in peril some way, or some kind of connection to him, and you fight alongside the great Ru Dr. Rudolph Van Richen. It's a great concept and a great idea, but the execution is lacking, and like I said, this thing should have been twice as big. If this thing had been twice as big, it would have been really good. And next up, the last Van Richen guide. Well, sort of. We'll say that. Is his guide to the Vistani, which is the Gypsies. Over three decades ago, the only child of Dr. Rudolf Van Richen was stolen by Vistanti thieves and sold to a vampire. The doctor's efforts to rescue his son and then avenge himself upon that vampire led to a dark new career fighting the terrifying monsters in the Demi Planet Dread. Now the Sage of Ravenloft turns his attention to the very people who made him what he is today. In spite of his deepest fears and hatred, Van Richen has passed among the Vistanti, the Nomads of the Mist, and he's learned much. Within this book, he describes the Vistanti legends, their everyday life, abilities common to them all, and some of the fell powers possessed. Fortunately, by only a few. Van Richen also identifies each of the Vistanti tribes, their strange and special powers, and their habits and beliefs. In addition, an appendix is provi provided for the generation of a Vistanti player character, which had not been done before. Now, the Vistanti are gypsies, and they've played a role in just about everything Ravenloft so far. And they were always this group that was supposed to be mysterious, they can navigate the mist and stuff like that. I personally have always found them a little boring because they weren't fleshed out enough, and they've mainly been used for plot devices or conveniences. So honestly, I was not looking forward to this guy. This is probably was the guy I was least forward or interested in. However, once I read it, this is one of the best Van Richen guides. It's arguably the best. I don't think it's the best, but I know a lot of people think it's the best, and I'm, I can't argue with them on that. It's so well written, and the stories of Van Richen are so good, and this book does such a good job of fleshing out the mysterious... Vistanti, without giving away their mystery, to be honest with you, and it's a damn good Van Richen guide. It really is, and I don't know. I can't. I can't stress enough. Of course, you get all the VR guides, but this one is really well written. It's like they had perfected the series down to a T. They knew what they were doing, and you know. This can this arguably some of the some of the people's best, but yes, a definitely a must have. Okay, especially it gives a lot more information about Van Van Richen's past than most things do, because he ends up making you know tells how he made peace with the gypsies because he couldn't stand the gypsies after they kidnapped his son and sold him to the vampire. So you know it, it's really a good good tale. Um, fleshes them out but keeps the mystery which is something that's hard to do and you know uh, it's not boring at the least which was what I thought it was going to be but I was completely wrong next up we have another great module the evil eye 
Welcome to NVIDIA, where Vintes Vistanti curses come to their terrible fruition. As a young girl, Gabrielle Adair was warned by her mother never to have children. A man, a babe, a home, these things can never be for you. A tragedy will be the only result. Now the witch Gabrielle has disobeyed her mother and born a child, an abomination that could spell doom for the Vistanti everywhere. Gabrielle has learned too late the truth of her mother's prophecy. The Evil Eye is a series of six scenarios involving the Vistanti and their most hated nemesis, the legendary Dukar. This, the adventure uncovers the hidden secrets of Carnell, the largest town in NVIDIA and home to the most terrifying festival in Ravenloft. The heroes will arrive to see a town in the throes of Carnival, a time when ghosts and madmen, werewolves and gypsies all mingle under the waxing moon. Inside this package is a 64 page book containing all the information needed to run the evil eye plus a full color map sheet showing the land of NVIDIA. Van Richen's Guide to the Vistanti and Van Richen's Guide to Fiends are helpful sources of information to expand and enrich these adventures but are not necessary to play. In NVIDIA was a domain, is a domain in the core of Ravenloft and Gabrielle the witch, <clears throat> now she's not like the wicked witch of the west ugly and shit like that. She's like a half gypsy. Uh, her mother was a gypsy. Um, she didn't like her mother because her mother told her she could never have kids or something because she'd be cursed if she did. Uh, so she has this power to cast spells, uh, you know, perform rituals and do the evil eye on people. But she's immune to it from other gypsies and stuff like that. She's a very vain and evil lady. But she's not evil. She's not like homicidal serial killer evil. She's more like. Hey, I do what I want, and I get what I want, and anybody who gets in my way uh, is going to suffer type of evil. Every now and then spiteful because she sees people being happy, and she's not happy. Okay? Well, the Vistanti, the gypsies, have a prophecy about a, a being called the Dukar, who, can, who will end up destroying all the gypsies and can leave and travel be the only type of being that can travel and leave Ravenloft at will. He can go wherever the hell he wants. Out of Ravenloft, anywhere in Ravenloft, and, and he'll have a passion to destroy the gypsies. Well, one night, uh, Gabrielle was visited by the Gentleman Caller, who's been a reoccurring character popping up in a few Ravenloft products here and there. And basically what he does is he causes problems. Um, he sets up something so a big bad event would happen later on. Nobody knows who he really is. Nobody knows what his goal is. But he's been in a few Ravenloft products. Well, anyways, he's a demon. But he's a good looking demon. <laughs> so he ends up sleeping with Gabrielle. And she becomes pregnant. And it's a fast pregnancy. And it's basically like she's the birth mother of the Antichrist. It's basically what it, it kind of boils down to. Um, she has the baby. Uh, the baby grows up real quick. And he can go wherever the hell he wants. Teleport wherever the hell he wants. He can't stand the gypsies. He killed them on sight. Well, he ends up basically imprisoning his mother by making her go crazy imprisoning her and he's basically ruling the land of NVIDIA. She's still technically the Dark Lord because he hasn't fully embraced ruling the land because if he fully embraces ruling the land then he'll be stuck here and can't leave and do what he wants to do which is just travel around everywhere any place and kill all the gypsies. Um, so he hasn't fully embraced the Dark Lord shit. That's why he hasn't killed her. He lives her alive. Well, anyway, she has a former lover uh, who happens to be a, a, a werewolf or a wolf were. <laughs> Whichever one. And uh, a werewolf is a man who turns into a wolf. A wolf were is a wolf that can turn into a man. And the wolf is smart. So, okay. So, anyways... He, he gets the heroes to help him free her and basically stop him. And you got to get the gypsies give you this thing to end up uh, this, this relic that you end up having to, or it's kind of a kind of spell that you have to throw at him 
and it'll bind him to the land where he can't go around and kill all the gypsies and escape Ravenloft because they believe if he escapes Ravenloft he can set the apocalypse of the world and that's basically the goal of this but man this this module it is so good you you play with the Taroka deck in this one again which not enough modules do hell they give you two different decks for two different products it's got a good full color map size map it details the land of NVIDIA which hadn't been done before you go over Gabrielle and um, and she's a dark lord and we hadn't really had anything to deal with her and it is such a great module you you have all these different things going on you have the serial killer that's going around killing people you have uh, huh, um, uh, one faction here another faction there it's a lot of intrigue it is a one it's probably one of the best adventures in Ravenloft great stuff highly recommend Man, it is a good adventure. Next up, The Nightmare Lands, the box set. Okay, so The Nightmare Lands is damn good. It says, Beware of the night, for sleep provides another path to the demi plane of dread. In the unique domain called The Nightmare Lands, darkness offers not a blissful slumber, but ultimate terror. Heroes enter this realm at the bidding of the night, drawn for their dreaming bodies and captured by an enigmatic figure known as the Nightmare Man. Trapped in this region of psychological fear, heroes face the worst nightmares and strange surrealistic terrain. If they escape the treacherous clutches of dark slumber, they'll be safe, at least until the next time sleep overtakes them. This box set contains everything necessary to adventure among the dark dream states and twisted nightmares, including the Journal of Dr. Ilhausen, 32 pages of notes and information on the nightmare lands compiled by the chief physician of Nova Vassa's infamous clinic for the mentally distressed. Rules of dreams and nightmares, 64 pages full of rules dealing with adventuring in dreams and nightmares, setting up nightmare scenarios, and transplanting player characters into dreamscape versions of themselves. Book of Nightmares, 64 pages of ready to play nightmares that incorporate all the information in this campaign expansion into one full length adventure. New Monsters, 16 pages of never-before-seen creatures, creatures unique to the Nightmare Lands and the Domain of Dreams. Poster maps, two full-color size poster maps. Okay, this is honestly one of my favorite products. That's not saying it has flaws, because it, it does have flaws, but most of the flaws are with the new Dream Powers rules and, and stuff like that. It's a little cumbersome. I used them a couple times. I didn't really like using them most of it. I don't think it used one or two things from it and then the rest of the time I just used regular rules but they just happened to be in the dream well. Well it used to be the Nightmare Lands was this land right here next to Nova Vassa and if, if you remember looking at the first map it was there next to Nova Vassa and uh, there was not much of a description about the Nightmare Lands in the first original black box it just said nobody knew who rules this land it's chaotic it can be raining one second hot the next and such and such I don't think they really knew what the hell they wanted to do with the Nightmare Lands. So, after the Grand Conjunction, Nightmare Lands was removed and it became an island of terror. Then they come out with this box set and it, it details this thing so good. I just, I just love this, this expansion. It's one of my favorites. And, um, yeah, the Nightmare Man is the big baddie of this domain. But he has like these lieutenants, uh, like four lieutenants, the, what is that, the ballet dancer lady who's, um, lives in the ghostly theater, and, <clears throat> yeah, here at the Nightmare Lands, that, this evil black witch, the guy Hypnos, and, uh, some kind of primeval beast type thing, but this is the Nightmare Lands right here. See, and it's uh, the Rocky Shoals. You have the Ring of Dreams where you can observe and look at other people's dreams or dreaming. The force of ever change is always moving. The ghettos, the City of Nod, obviously a throwback to uh, Dante's Inferno. The Dark Primeval where this one of the lieutenants lives. The Theater Macabre where the other one is. The Spiral of Sleep where the, uh, Hypnos lives. And then you have, the, of course, the Grieving Cathedral. And you have a 
dream version of the clinic of the mentally distressed. Man, is this thing so good. This is like as close to Arkham Horror just about as Ravenloft gets. I don't know how else to say that. And it's, uh, yeah, the Book of Nightmares. He has, no, I guess he has more than four lieutenants. He has a couple of them. Well, anyways, without giving away too much, it's basically, there was this doctor. He was a psychiatrist in Nova Vassa, Dr. Ilhausen. And slowly, people started going crazy and talking about this stalking in their dreams and stuff like that. And these monsters in their dreams and everything. And, um, you know, you get crazies, you don't think much of it. But eventually, patients started, who never met before, um, started basically giving the same details about the same types of creatures that would haunt them in their dreams and do things. And, um, <laughs> so there's the ghost dancer. She's one of his lieutenants, and if you get caught in her theater macabre, she slices you up. <laughs> she was like a ballet or something. I don't know what it was. Hypnose, who just lies in his glass coffin, always with one eye open, affecting dreams. And they each have their own territory of what kind of dreams they invade. See, the Nightmare Man very rarely invades other people's dreams and does it. He lets his lieutenants do that, and then he feeds off of them. So she'll like um, invade dreams that, uh, of guilt and shame. And he'll like invade dreams that uh, frustration and inadequacy. Then you have Morpheus, he's another lieutenant. Morgana, which is another lieutenant. And then the Nightmare Man. And then there's another one. There's a, what is the, the Rainbow Serpent. There's, yeah, there it is. Another one. And so they basically invade people's dreams <sighs> make them go crazy type and feed off of them and they eventually come to the nightmare lands that's where they go in their dreams they're, they're in the nightmare lands and eventually they go crazy kill a bunch of people or get killed and stuff like that and the nightmare man what he'll do is he'll look in on some of these things and feed off of it and that's him right here and he's a mystery as to why he does this who he is or anything but he's really creepy he's you know he's all he's got spiders crawling all over him and that other art doesn't show it but it his cloak is made of spider webs and he's got spiders crawling all over him and so the basic gist of this is this doctor finds out a little bit what's going on and he he sends a message uh, because you're a famous group or did something that please help him well, one day his freaking insane asylum and everybody in it just disappear poof and they end up in the nightmare lands and you have to go to the nightmare lands and you confront a couple of his, the nightmare man's lieutenants and try to free him and bring him back from the nightmare lands realm and um, that insane asylum has some creepy, creepy stuff going on. Um, evil stuff, Arkham Horror type of stuff, and the monsters there. I just, I just, the Nightmare Lands was basically started off as, hey, we kind of want a Freddy Krueger type killer here in Ravenloft, and just. They didn't know how to do it, so they kind of left it open for a long time, and they figured out what they wanted to do, and they came out with this box set, and boy, is this great. Highly, highly recommend it. The adventure is really good, really creepy, although there's no clear-cut finale for the adventure. That can be a problem for some people. Um, no like in confrontation with the nightmare man or knowing anything about him he's still left to be a somewhat of a mystery you do confront a couple of the lieutenants not all of them um, the dream power rules for stuff that happens in the dreams are a little wonky 
and really you pick and choose what you want to use because if you go by them they're not that great uh, however any good DM can tweak something to his liking I recommend you do so this is a definitely must have recommend get and it was only 20 bucks 20 bucks all right, and another thing I'll say about the Nightmare Lands, the last thing I'll say about it is the story, the background and everything from Dr. Ilhausen to what was going on as Asylum, it's a great read. It's a great spooky read. God, it's a good read. I, I just love that module. Next up, Neither Man Nor Beast. It's basically the island of Dr. Moreau. It says, Shipwrecked on a desert island, marooned among savage creatures who seem half human, half animal, who can you trust? Kindly old Dr. Fran and his beautiful companion, the strange monk said to guard an evil artifact in their mountain fastness, or the beast man chief who gathers his people and prepares for war. Time is short, for you must escape the domain of this Dis Dios and Ballot. I don't know how you pronounce that. The master of pain before the island works its curse on you and your companions, in turn leaving you neither man nor beast. So man nor beast. Markovia, here, used to be a domain in the core like I said and it was kind of based off of the island of Dr. Monroe but not an island it was just this guy who who uh, Fran Fran Markov I think his name was who experimented on people beast you know animals and stuff like that didn't care about nobody he was a butcher uh, experimented on the animals he slaughtered and then would sell the stuff. Well, his wife told on him eventually, so he experimented on her, tried to hook animal limbs to her. She died. He got ran out. Uh, of, I think he was in Barovia too. And then a, a domain formed called Markovia for him. Thing was, was he got to keep his human head, but his body was that of a beast once he became the Dark Lord. Usually he keeps it as a gorilla and just wears heavy clothing around so you can't tell. He's wanting to cure himself big time. Of course, he's cursed by Ravenloft. He'll never find a cure. So he experimented on people and, and just gruesome experiments. And he ends up creating a bunch of these man, women, beast type people like in the island of Dr. Moreau. And... Um, once his domain gets put into the Sea of Sorrows, well, fresh meat is in shorter supply. Uh, one of the beast men he created, the lion beast guy, wants to have a revolution against him. He wants you, he's deceiving you, he wants you to kind of help him. And it's it's a really fun module. I love it. It's another home run out of the park. It comes with a nice map. And this time you get one for the players and one for the DM because you're going to go there. There, See, the thing is, he wants you to go to get this artifact from this abandoned monastery. Because remember, it, 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 the domain used to be in the core. Uh, uh, so there was an, a, mon a monastery there, but it is abandoned. But it's not really abandoned. It's guarded by these monks, but these monks, because of the artifact, are trying to turn into... Uh, mummies but they're not like wrapped bandage mummies they're just clo cloaked monks who don't talk or nothing and they just guard the thing if you don't bother them they don't bother you they don't go out and kill nobody or anything like that but uh, the artifact that uh, he's wanting you to get for him is this table that if somebody's laying on it they can't die so you, he can perform all kinds of gruesome experiments on the people and they won't die can, they're cut open they'll feel the pain but they won't die. He's one tricking you into get it, so you end up getting that for him. But then the Lion King, Man Beast guy, um, tells you how he really is and is going to assault him and all that kind of stuff. Assault his compound, and you know, of course, you're you're shipwrecked on the island um, when you're traveling by boat and so, stuff like that. Most of the crew dies. It's a really it's a really good adventure. At the end, it really gets apocalyptic where, you know, oh crap, there's these two forces going at each other and you're stuck in the middle. And wow. And it, it leaves things open-ended too because as you decide with the uh, 
the man beast and his his revolutionaries they'll leave uh, Dr. Fran quote unquote Dr. Fran in prison on that table forever while they just torture him and so he'll still be alive but he'll still <laughs> he'll be tortured forever whereas if you have him defeat the uh, the man beast you know he'll probably he's gonna turn around and try to experiment on you eventually and so you was really just want to get off the island it's a really good adventure it's for levels one through four so it's a good beginning adventure you know um, it still does have that hey you're in a, another campaign setting take the ship you enter the mist and get stuck in Markovia but it also has to where hey you're on a ship here like one of these lands in Ravenloft and you can go there really fun adventures very underrated it doesn't get a lot of mention I don't know why I think it's a really good adventure it's another top top notch must have and also of course it, it, it does my golden rule it details a domain that had very little detail about it, and it details a Dark Lord that had uh, his history had not been fully fleshed out. And so it is a great, great module. And so I highly recommend it. Alright, next up, Forged of Darkness. It's one of the few missteps from this era. Absolute power. In the bewitched domain of Tempest, Tempest, under the pale amber light of a full moon, a wandering band of adventurers comes across the severed hand of a hanged man. Far beneath Darkon's dread castle Avernus, a mysterious black vault is sealed, locking away an assortment of magical arms and armor until such time as the cause of evil demands their service. Across the dread domains of Ravenloft, sinister craftsmen created magical items of unequal power and absolute evil. Forge of Darkness presents players in a dungeon master with a collection of magical items, each of which carries the distinctive taint of the Demi Planet Dread. This 64-page omnibus of diabolical devices is certain to add an element of the macabre to any Ravenloft campaign. Um, this was a disappointment, and I'm going to explain what this basically is. <laughs> You ever heard of Friday the 13th, the series? I know you most people have heard of Friday the 13th movie, but Friday the 13th movies where Jason went around, you know, in a hockey mask killing people. But there was a TV show based off of Friday the 13th that had nothing to do with Friday the 13th, the movies. <laughs> I know it's crazy. But in the 80s, 90s, there was the TV show Friday the 13th, the series. And what it was was this uh, antique shop that had all these cursed items in it. And basically, the owner of the shop, well, the owner of the shop made a deal with the devil, and all the items in there got cursed, and he sold the items and stuff like that. And if you get an item, you're gonna uh, become cursed. Like you may get an item that these gloves, where if you use these gloves, you can play piano really great and become a uh, superstar and, and, and famous person. But the but the gloves make you want to kill people and stuff like that and so the the, the Friday 13th the series uh, these people uh, took over the shop the store and every episode was about them going and finding another artifact for, that had been sold from the place and getting it back and stopping the curse from happening to the people usually it's too late you <laughs> person's already going around killing people like crazy and so that was the concept of Friday 13th the series force of darkness is kind of is a concept based off of that you have all these cursed items all over the realm of Ravenloft and they give stories to some or most of them that are somewhat detailed and there's a few references to famous people that you've already you know uh, dealt with here and there and the idea is you can take these items and sprinkle them in your campaigns uh, you can have you can make your own campaign where you got to go after this item that's located in the black vault and, and stuff like that, or you know track down this item. That's what this thing did. I really never found any use for it. I found most of the uh, background information on a lot of these items too too little, too vague, and just too boring to be honest with you. So I really did not care for this item. I thought it was a waste of a product. They could have come out with something better. I saw what they're going for. I just didn't think the execution was good. So Forge of Darkness is one of the few Ravenloft products. Unless you're a completionist, I just don't recommend it. It brings nothing to the table. You have other cursed items 
and stuff like that in some of the other source books. So if you just want to sprinkle cursed items in the campaign, either make something up or use one of them. You don't need that book for it. Children of the Night Vampires. Okay, so basically what Children of the Night is now the new series that's going to replace the Van Retching Guides. Children of the Night, and you're going to have a Children of the Night for every Van Retching Guide that came out. So that is what's going on with this. So let's see what this is about. Behold the many faces of mankind's darkest enemy. Two puncture wounds mark the kiss of the Nosferatu. Blood trickles with the slow crawl of despair. A shadow lingers, black against black. Chill mist clings damply to every surface, and the echo of an angry shrink still hangs in the air. Vampires introduces 13 unique and terrifying villains of horrific proportions. Each one challenges vampire hunters to rethink common perception of these foes, and these are no ordinary undead. Each creature presented in this book is a unique individual with his own history, personality, and powers. The lords of the night that adventure will meet include Jandir Sunstar. Here we go. He's the hero of Vampires of the Mist. One of the oldest vampires in the land of the mist. I'm not even going to try to pronounce this thing's name. A seagoing monster with a taste for fishermen. Lady Adeline, an elf vampire who seeks out light rather than hiding from it. Lisa Von Zerovich, who covets the power of her great uncle Strahad, and many more. Children of the Night Vampires is the first book in a new series that brings to unlock the creatures, creature types treated in the best-selling Van Richen guides. Each volume offers biographies and distinct and monstrous villains easily added to any game. Short adventures featuring each nemesis which can stand alone or form a mini-campaign. You can eight ways to fight each foe and adventure hooks for using them as reoccurring villains. This series would become not quite as acclaimed as the Van Retching Guides, but close to it. And for good reason. It's good. So you have Jandir Sunstar. So it updates him. At the end of Vampires of the Mish, he dies. But he didn't really die. He's back. Lisa Von Zerovich, you saw her in Thoughts of Darkness when she was trying to help the Mind Flyers form Vampiric Mind Flyers. Moesha, eh, not really a good one. Auburn Beck is okay. Lady Adeline will become a uh, reoccurring figure in Ravenloft and mentioned again. Uh, this thing, eh. Don Pablo, eh. Alexi. This Jack Be Quick, Leather Lady Heather Shadowbrook, Ezra, Hungerness, and Marla. All the, the the twist with these is that all these vampires are different from your normal vampire. They have a different trait about them that makes them unique. And so, and this is going to become a template. So, what this book does is we're going to get into okay so what this book does is first it introduces your vampire it gives a background a personality about him and tips to help plug him into a campaign if you want to then it has a short adventure detailing with that vampire uh, now this Jandir he's a good guy so you kinda team up with him in this adventure but if you wanted to, you could you could kill him. And so you have a short adventure with him. It's only a few pages, and that's it. And then you go on, like Auburn Beck here. He has his bio, and then you have a short adventure with him. Now, some of these, um, are hit and miss. To be honest with you, sometimes. The crazy uniqueness of these people just make them seem crazy and hokey and outlandish, and not in a good way. I'd be honest with you. Yeah, uh, this manta ray vampire that they got in here is just goofy. The Alexi vampire who's kind of visible and he has to scare you is just kind of goofy. See, there's that, that thing right there. Now, this was the first book, so they haven't got it perfected yet in this new series, okay? Let's just say that. But there are some gems in here. Jandir Stunsar, Lace Von Zerovich, Lady Adeline, 
and a few of the others are really unique and a few of the adventures are good the problem is with a lot of these little mini adventures is some of them they're just too short to be honest with you they're just too short and some of the vampires are off the wall just too goofy however for the gems that it does have it redeems this product so this product is I know I think this product is praised a lot more than it should be I don't think this book is as good as it as its reputation however this is still a good product I still would recommend that because there are still some good stuff in here and good people you could always add to your campaigns and some of these adventures in here are good little mini adventures the Lady Adeline one is, is the best to me it's the standout of this because she has a maze of thorns that is just filled with traps and stuff like that she's like uh, the Lord of Valkan, Valkan Baron Uke von Karnoff. she's kinda like his lieutenant um, so not a great product but it's like I said it's the first one they did so they hang out the formula down correct but I do recommend you getting it it's just not a must must buy I would uh, get a lot of others before this but still a good book now we come to what is considered probably the biggest misstep of what I like to call the golden age and something that gets a very bad rap and I think it gets too much of a bad rap and I don't think it's as bad as people make them out to be and that is the Grim Harvest series and the Grim Harvest series is a trilogy of modules uh, that is supposed to culminate in a big world changing type event all having to deal with Azel and the Lynch okay and yes there are missteps yes there are mistakes and yes there are problems with these but these are not total dreck like a lot of people say they are um, the first one in this adventure is Death Unchained now as you can see at this point in time Ravenloft underwent some, some structural changes okay you have your typical Ravenloft looking module here children of the night vampires kinds of changes up the the art direction they were go for and then boom now the Ravenloft adventures are going to start having these little wrought iron gate or whatever it is around them I did not like that change there was no need for it the logo got smaller see this is this was another problem look see how big that logo is okay now compare it to Children of the Night where it gets smaller. And this was an attempt by TSR who at this time now is starting to the money problems of the company are starting to bubble a little bit to the surface. And so this was an attempt by them to say <clears throat> Children of the Night for use with all campaign settings hey man I don't play Ravenloft I play Greyhawk but this is I can use this for my campaign setting see it used to be exclusivity you know you, you played Ravenloft you had a Ravenloft module you had a Ravenloft supplement it stayed in Ravenloft sure you could use it for other stuff but it mainly stayed in Ravenloft well, TSR was starting to have problems so they're like well let's try to expand let's try to get uh, people play other campaign settings to kind of have a look at our stuff and so they're going to shrink the Ravenloft logo and make it look unlike the other Ravenloft modules in an attempt to bring other people from other campaigns into it look I'm all for that you want to get as many people as you can to like your product and keep going I certainly want as many people as they can get to love Ravenloft but don't dilute the product to do so okay I get you want people who play car tour uh, dark sun Greyhawk, forgotten realms I get you want more people to come and play Ravenloft because the more people that come and buy Ravenloft products the more successful it is and the more successful it is the more money TSR makes off of it the more money TSR makes off of it the more products are gonna put out so they can make more money and the circle continues just don't dilute your product and that's going to become a problem, okay? And, and and now you can start seeing the really the beginning of the end started with Children of the Night Vampires, but we still have some ways to go before it all becomes unraveled. 
Well, Death Unchained. You have no friends here. What can you do when the mist deposit you in the city of Leekar? The militia is no better than a gang of sadistic bullies. The citizens are more contagious than a fleet of plague ships. And every foot of public space is covered with corpses of criminals who committed no crime greater than struggling to survive in the oppressive domain of Falknovia. Danger haunts your every move. A secret society of assassins known only as the Ebon Fold has been hunting down visitors to Leekar and killing them in the most grisly fashion. All that remains of the victims are desiccated husks that crumble to ash when touched, and you are their next targets. There is no escape. When everyone who has befriended you is either dead or hunted by the authorities, you have no choice but to fight back. But the Ebon Fold is a numerous horde whose leader holds sway over death. How can you defeat enemies that won't stay in the grave? They strike from the depths of darkness and steal your life one dagger stroke at a time. This 64-page adventure can be played independently or as an open challenge in the Grim Harvest series that continues with Death Ascendant and concludes with Requiem. Inside this package is a poster map that fully details all ten levels of the chilling complex known as the Well of Bones. It was actually supposed to be four modules. Death Undaunted was supposed to be part of it, but it got cut short. Money, financial, purposes, stuff like that. You're also going to notice a format change inside as well. There you go. That used to not be like that. The maps have a different tone to them. Now, honestly, <clears throat> I think this map kicks ass. Okay? But you don't need the background of a skull, chains, and a rat on the freaking page. Okay? I don't know, I don't know what the hell was going through their head. But the map itself, I think, is actually really cool. And let's have a look inside this product here because you're going to see more stuff like, hey, there's that skull with chains. The art has taken a dive. Hey, there's a photocopy picture of a rat right there. Okay. Um, yeah. Now this module is considered to be pretty terrible. Falknovia is considered to be mishandled. And let's talk about Falknovia. It's a domain here in the core and it is ruled by Vlad Dracoff, which is basically he's the human version of Dracula. He's not a vampire, but he's a brutal sadistic dude who loves watching people be impaled every night. And he's a military man who rules the realm, his lord realm with iron fists and the army him, he's the liberal leader. He hates magic, so magic is uh, outlawed. Um, and it's kind of based off of also the SS Gestapo, really, um, type thing, where he has all these uh, SS Gestapo who are sycophant loyal to him. Um, every night he watches people be, his own citizens be impaled on spikes. Um, the people there are in misery, sanitation is terrible, um, they're poor, starving, dirty, filthy, and they're second class citizens. The only true citizen is a man of uh, Vlad Dracov's army. And they can run around and they can basically, if they wanted to, they can come up, take your wife and rape her, and she can do nothing about it. And that's the way that country is run. It's a total shithole of a domain. People tend to avoid it like the plague. Uh, you cannot leave. He cannot seal his borders. He's one of the few Dark Lords who cannot seal his borders. But he has people, his army patrolling the borders. He, if you get caught trying to escape, nobody leaves. He, if you are a visitor to the realm, uh, you have to have papers, please. I need to see your papers, please. I need to see your papers, please, and you're always being watched. If you're a citizen born of the realm, you have a branded hawk branded on your forehead. Um, <laughs> uh, he's the only domain lord who has tried to invade other domains. <clears throat> like, he's tried to invade Darkon several times, but he doesn't understand the nature of the realm of dread, so he's been unsuccessful every time. Um, he just craves power. He just wants to rule the land, but he can't because he doesn't believe in magic 
or understand any of that stuff and that's what the stuff that tries to defeat him he doesn't understand that a domain lord can seal his border wherever or they can you know the Aisling can raise dead zombies time and time again he, he just doesn't he he, he just can't grasp that. He can't believe that he loses because he thinks everybody's inferior to him. Well, this adventure takes place in Likar here. And basically what it's about is there's this cult, the Ebon Fold, who are not dead. They're reanimated people. They're undead. They're going around killing people with these special knives. Once they kill the person, it... Uh, <clears throat> It sucks their life force into the knife. So basically, you track these guys down. They're trying to kill you, but you end up tracking them down to their headquarters in Likar, which doesn't really make sense because Drakov's military would root them out, but they give some excuse like they bribe them or something. I don't know. And you basically infiltrate their headquarters and that Well of Bones map you see and find out that they were uh, that these people are undead that they're stabbing people taking their life force all for some big part and their their ritual to be done in Darkon which is Aislinn's domain and they have a leader of the Karagat which is Aislinn's secret police is the mastermind behind all of it so far and that kind of stuff it's basically a whole hum adventure that does not fit the tone that Ravenloft is going for a lot of fantasy elements uh, Falknovia is not explored really Likar is but but sort of but not really um, I understand why it gets the terrible rep that it does why this series gets the terrible rep that it does but is not a terrible thing. You can find a nugget of something in here. Do I recommend it? Well, honestly, yeah. If you are a completionist, if you uh, want to play this trilogy, which this trilogy has a major outcome in the land of, of dread, um, it's a decent campaign because it starts out five through seven and you know you work your way higher but you're going to be doing a lot of tweaking with this if you DM it to be honest with you and um, so I would definitely get other adventures before this but um, you may if, if you like the old style of Dungeons and Dragons where you just go in and hack and slash and, and stuff like that it's it, it was going. It was against what Ravenloft was going for at the time. And yeah, I get it. If not, I wouldn't worry about it. All right. So then we have the second adventure in Death Ascendant, and we still are using this style of stupidity with these photocopied stuff. Crap. Um, terrible art. But we do get some a cool map again. And here's the map for this one. And it is Temple of the Eternal Order. Okay. Now, this stuff is all new for, for Aislin and Darkon and all that stuff. But this stuff will become mainstay in Ravenloft. So here we go. Death is in the cards. The remnants of the Ebonfold are cutting a deadly path through Falknovian countryside, draining travelers of their life force and leaving withered corpses in their wake. Hot on the trail, you come across the sole survivor of one of these deadly attacks, a young Vistanti man with an extraordinary skill for fortune telling. Okay, that goes against all known Vistante stuff. It's always the females that have the power of fortune telling. So, uh, I, that's a big no no. His stroke deck helps close the gap between you and the assassins. Together, you follow the trail through Darkon, the dark domain of the Lynch Lord Aislin, to the city of Nartok. With an unholy alliance, something very strange is happening in Nartok. The killers enter the Temple of Eternal Order and don't come out. It seems that the state religion of Darkon is giving succor to these assassins. To make matters more confusing, the Karagat, the Domain's secret police, has put aside its feud with the Eternal Order and has a large contingent staying at the temple as well. These three organizations working together bodes ill for the residents of Nartok. And schemes within Infernal Schemes. Great, amount of life, great amounts of life energy are being collected for some foul purpose. Although no one seems to know what exactly it is, 
The Taroka cards provide only mysterious glimpses of the future. A future in which a powerful evil sweeps the land and death walks the world. Can you discover the truth of what is happening in the temple in time to avert the disaster predicted by the cards? Death Ascended is a full-length adventure that can be run as a standalone scenario or the second part of the Grim Harvest series. It contains a 64-page adventure booklet plus a full-color poster map detailing the Temple of Eternal Order. 6 to 8. Now, Death Ascended is better than Death Unchained. Okay? Um, there are some improvements on it. Uh, the Temple of Eternal Order isn't introduced in this. Now, this really hadn't existed before in Darkon. I mean, we... If you're a fan of Ravenloft, know anything about Ravenloft, you basically know Aislin, um history. You know he hates Strahd. You've dealt with him in one module, in two modules before. He's a ruler of Darkon. He's a lynch, but the citizens don't know he's a lynch. They just know he's like a wizard king. Um, they think he uses magic to prolong his life. Uh, he wants to escape Ravenloft badly because he can't learn new magic. Um, he killed his son, his, his own son for failing him and that kind of stuff. And he rules Darkon. He's like a iron fist in a velvet glove. Um, the very mention of him scares people. And he can, people know that he's resurrected the dead on the borders, uh, to seal the borders, uh, when, like, Falknovia invaded. They know he hates Strahd, but they don't see him as the boogeyman. They just say him as their, their lord, that he must be obeyed without question. And if you obey Aislinn and you serve him well, he doesn't go out of his way to kill you. It's not like he's looking for reasons to murder his citizens. But he does have this, his secret police, the Karagat, who are usually filled with all types of different monsters like werebeasts or some are even undead, uh, going around spying on everybody and spying on other domain lords mainly. Because he wants as much information as he can on the other lords and what they're up to so he can finally leave. Well, the Temple of Eternal Order is a religion introduced in this series where the people worship um, basically death. And for the time when the death will, dead will walk the earth, because they've seen it before when he's raised the dead on the borders and stuff like that. Um... And so, it's kind of like a state religion. Now, them and the state religion, like all powerful organizations, don't get along. Okay? The eternal order is always wanting to put everybody down to please, so they can please Aislinn, so they can get more power, while the Karagat's doing the same thing. They don't like each other. So, basically, what you come to find out is, uh, you track the... Remembrance of the El El Eben Fold to uh, their Temple of Eternal Order in Nartok. And you basically learn that <clears throat> their leader, I think, is, uh, what's his name? Let me look at his name. The leader of the, um, hang on, what is that? what's his name? Lolan Desheen. Okay, he is the leader of the Eternal Order. And he is a high-ranking member of the Karagat. And he's basically a clone of Aislinn. Aislinn experimented with cloning to try to be able to leave the, uh, the realm and stuff like that. And impregnated women <laughs> magically. And he ended up being one of Aislinn's clone children. So he rose through the ranks and stuff like that. So Aislin trusts him a lot. And Aislin's new scheme is to find a way to become a demi lynch. And he thinks if he can become a demi lynch, which a demi lynch is, I don't really have to want to go into it, but it's a lynch who's evolved into a higher state. His spirit or mind travels through realms unknown while what remains of his body, usually a skull and a pile of dust with some gems in the skull socket stays behind. And if you go disturb it, his spirit will come back to it. Basically, Aislin cannot, by normal means, by which lynches become demi-lynches, he cannot become a demi-lynch because he cannot learn the new magic required to do so. So he's trying to find a different way to become a demi-lynch. And he's trying to perform this ritual with all these life force and stuff like that. 
when you infiltrate the temple of the eternal order and uh, you're, they experiment they, of course you, before you do any big great experiment to see if it's success you want to have a test Lola and Deshane becomes the test in this one and they use the life force from the <clears throat> daggers they put it in this big hourglass type thing with Lolan in it or is it a coffin he's in and then the other one is for the next module some way anyways uh, it transforms Lolan into basically death um, he looks like the Grim Reaper um, He's very powerful. He controls the dead. He's insubstantial except for his skull and his hands. And he's kind of a powerhouse. And that's basically what happens is you you get there, you, you, you go through there, the, the, the test rituals was performed, he becomes death, and, and, and they kill everybody that goes in there, all the citizens. They make all the citizens show up to observe the ritual and when the citizens go in they be they're killed instantly and become undead because their life force is sucked from them or something like that is that I, well that may be the next one t next module too I don't know it's uh, where something like that happens but anyways and that's the gist of it and so he ends up fleeing you end up driving him off after he becomes death and he goes and flees to Aislin and that's where the next module will pick up it is better than Death Unchained. It's still not perfect by any means. It's still got its problems. Um, but like I said, it's still still better than the other one. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Now I want to do something a little bit out of order. We're going to go ahead and we're going to continue with Requiem the Grim Harvest. Alright. Now William L. Connors now Lisa Smedman wrote the first two adventures. Now William Connors comes in and he did he you know has an unfinished manuscript for Death Undaunted, which would be the fourth fourth one. They have a what would it would have been on the secrets uh, I mean the fraternity of shadows and it's very interesting, it's very good. Lee comes in and helps, and here's the box set for it. At midnight everyone will die. Aislinn, the Lynch Lord, is launching another diabolical plan. He has allied himself with the entity known as Death, and together they plan to raise the domain of Darkon. From the ashes of this once mighty land will rise a new domain, Necropolis, the land of the dead. For the citizens of Darkon, Death has been an everyday companion, and sometimes a yearning for an end to the suffering. However, now the cold comfort of the grave is forever denied. These good men and women, as they fled, find themselves walking the land after their breath has left them. Heroes have always been considered... Uh, I've always considered the undead to be mere monsters, legions of mindless evil to be slain with no second thoughts. Now the heroes have learned the agony of actually being one of the living dead. They become the monsters and the entire world becomes their enemy. This box set contains everything necessary to take your characters beyond Death's Veil and into the shadowy world of Unlife, including Requiem. 96 pages of rules for the generation and play of undead player characters as well as tips for dungeon masters. This book details 12 different types of creatures that characters can become after death, as well as dozens of powers and weaknesses they may possess. Necropolis. 32 pages covering the new domain of Necropolis. Although little has changed physically in the former domain of Darkon, the people, animals, plants, and even the land itself has been infused with the power of the new demi-lord, Death. Death Triumphant. A 64-page adventure that puts the heroes in the middle of Lord Aislinn's ultimate scheme to escape from Ravenloft. Death Triumph can be played as a standalone adventure or as the final chapter in the Grim Harvest series. And then, of course, poster map. One two-sided full-color detailing the headquarters of Aislinn's secret police in the new domain of Necropolis. Alright, so let's get into this Grim Harvest series. First of all, it has a regional map of Necropolis, which uh, we'll get into in a minute. We have Requiem, Death Triumphant, and Necropolis. Okay, first let's get into... It still has the same format the other modules did. Let's get into the adventure itself. Now the adventure itself is not terrible. <clears throat> it's basically... <clears throat> you're going to the Karagat's headquarters. Aislinn is now going to conduct a ritual. Death is there. The former Lowland Sheen or whatever his name is, he's there. 
Aislinn's going to perform the ritual. Any, they force, I think this is one where they force all the people to walk into the, to attend mandatory service. And once they enter, their life force is sucked out of them. So you got to find a way to enter without that happening to you. <clears throat> you get there, uh, you try to stop the ritual, but you're just a little bit too late. And in the end, Aislinn and the machine explode. Aislin is nowhere to be seen or found. You don't really know what happened to him. He either died or his spirit was tossed to the ether or he escaped. The explosion was filled with so much negative energy it killed everybody in Necropolis. It's kind of like a nuke going off. I mean, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it's not in <clears throat> Darkon. It's Darkon's capital, and Luke. Uh, everybody in the city is killed. Building stand and stuff like that. But everybody in the city is killed. And those who weren't vaporized by the uh, explosion um, have become undead creatures who remember their past lives are just no longer living and dead. They can't leave the city. Uh, for various reasons, because once they leave the city, uh, they'll permanently they won't be able to they'll permanently die. I guess it's kind of weird. Uh, and because death holds sway over the city now, since Aislinn is gone, he rules the city. Uh, he doesn't rule the domain. I'll get into that in a second, but he's the lord of the city now, and he won't let nobody leave. You yourself become an undead character, and you're basically trying to leave the city, you, which you have to have another confrontation with death to do so, um, and you're trying to turn yourself back alive again after you leave the city or before you leave the city. The living cannot exist in the city. Anybody that's alive that walks into the city instantly becomes undead. So you're trying to reverse the process. That is the basic gist of the adventure. It's a dungeon crawl, then a way to escape the city and dealing with your new undead abilities slash curse. Okay? That's the gist of the adventure. It's not bad, it's not terrible. Um, the trying to stop Aislinn but failing to do so in time and being there when it explodes can be an epic uh, monumental event for the history books like the Grand Conjunction and when I always played it it was um, so that is a high point of history for Ravenloft. And that's really what makes the Grim Harvest series um, very important. However, the adventure itself is average. And people like me who enjoyed and liked Ravenloft had such high expectations we wanted better than average. Okay, so we got basically one below average and two average adventures with this series. Second point is let's talk about the undead characters. Now, the whole point of Ravenloft was to avoid becoming an undead character or a were beast type character, and you're trying to always find a resolution to it to where you could become normal if you got ever got infected with lycanthropy or bitten by a vampire or something like that. Uh, Ravenloft was very much against having characters, you having characters of that, that type of being an undead type character. That was a punishment. That's what made Ravenloft so special and so hard. Man, you get bit and you get turned into a vampire where well, you're going to have to lose your character. Your character's gone. You can't use him no more. You become an uh, agent of darkness. Well, in this, you're forced to become an undead character. Okay, but then they set up rules to where you can stay as an undead character or play as an undead character 
and the rules didn't make sense. For instance, not only was it very anti against what Ravenloft had been doing so far, is it was just some bad concepts. You could become a freaking skeleton for crying out loud. That's right, a skeleton. Okay? <laughs> I mean, let's look. Look. All right, let me see here. Um, you could become a skeleton. Yeah, that kind of sounds somewhat neat, but why the hell would anybody want to be a skeleton when your buddy over here, see, when your buddy over here can be a vampire? You know, depending on <laughs> what your your prime Wesley <laughs> requisite score was, was determining what your freaking what kind of freaking undead creature you could be so your buddy next to you could become a vampire or a lynch or a mummy and you're stuck as a lowly skeleton <laughs> terrible um huh. and it, it just it was just a bad idea i get that they tried you know had a lot of people say man come on let's play as undead let's play as undead i know from the beginning basically of ravenloft they people were saying, "Look, let's play as undead characters. I want to play. I want to be a vampire. I want to be a, a lynch. You know, I want to be a ghost. Stuff like that." But it just wasn't meant to be, and these rules were quickly ignored. Not too soon after, um, as far as being, they didn't outright say you can't do it anymore, but they just never really brought it up again. Um, saying you can't be undead characters because it does not fit for Ravenloft. And the third big bugaboo is that the land of Darkhan changed. There's a whole source book detailing the land of Darkhan. And basically, huh, and basically what happened was, was since Aislinn died, or supposedly died, death ruled the city, but he couldn't leave. Now, so what happened was Darkon got divvied up into different regions and each kind of had like a, a, a little demi-lord that was the leader of that region. <laughs> some were known, some weren't. And, and honestly, they were all boring. The changes to most of the regions was just unnecessary and it just, it just made things different yeah the mist region uh the bog lands the villateers um it just it just threw dark on out of whack and fortunately this is not going to stay like this dark on is going to come back and aislin is going to come back in full strength later on down the line and it just it just turned the once great powerful domain of dark on to a little fiefdom with a bunch of regions where these uninteresting people were leaders of that region and death was leader of the city of Luke. Now I do like death. I think he is a pretty cool concept. And I do like him having the idea of having a city of the dead, even though they already had one in uh, Forlorn. Um, huh. Um, I think it was Forlorn. Uh, or you know that these dead are going around with their normal lives they can't leave um it's kind of like you know a, a hell on earth type of thing I, I get where they get the inspiration for that and i like that uh they do eventually bring aislin back death does freaking um rule the city but that's it and he becomes a bitter enemy of aislin because he wants to somehow spread that negative energy that engulfs that city that makes everybody in there a dead person and he has control over them he wants to eventually try to spread it all over but he really can't so he's kind of stuck there um the grim harvest series is considered to probably be the biggest disappointment misstep in all of ravenloft's uh products basically um I don't think it's as bad as its reputation for it, but it's certainly not great. And what we were used to, especially with this era right here, was pure greatness. And uh, I think it was just a big misstep 
in order to let people use undead characters. You know, like I said, the rumblings of money woes were starting to surface. People wanted undead characters. Uh, they want, so you know what, even though it goes against what Ravenloft really is, we're going to give the people what they want to hopefully sell more products and, and stuff like that. They compromised the line with it. Um, do I recommend the Grim Harvest series? Honestly, I do, because there's a, still a lot there that is good and can be used because it is a good piece of history and it is a good epic trilogy. You have to do a lot of tweaks to see a big uh, earth-shattering experience in the realm of Ravenloft uh, because the Grim Harvest does last for a few years. The, the way Darkon is after the Grim Harvest does last like that for a few years. Aislinn does not come back like the next day or month or something like that. It's years before he comes back. So, the Grim Harvest series, Ravenloft's biggest disappointment. But during that time, we got Ravenloft's greatest accomplishment. Most people consider this to be the greatest box set, the greatest adventure in all of Ravenloft. And that is Bleak House, the death of Rudolph Van Ritchie. Old soldiers never die. For more than three decades, Dr. Rudolph Van Ritchie stood against the forces of darkness and hunted their servants in the far corners of the land of the mist. Now he had thought his long battle over. He thought he could spend his declining years in quiet enjoyment with old friends. But for some, a tragic end is inevitable. Dark forces have been gathering in the mist. Their objective is to see Ravenloft's foremost expert on the supernatural destroyed, shattered in spirit as well as in body, from the crumbling effigies of Van Richten's childhood home, an enemy long thought vanquished spins a web of powerful evils and lost souls, drawing Van Richten to his doom, and then a group of heroes gets trapped in the web as well. Witness the final stand of Rudolph Van Richten. Inside this box is a grand-scale Ravenloft adventure that pushes heroes to the brink of madness and draws them into the terrifying scheme to annihilate Rudolph Van Richten. The set contains Sea of Madness, a 96-page book detailing the island of Dominion and relating the events that start the cycle of doom. Homecoming, a 64-page book describing the Van Richten family estate and the large haunted mansion known as Bleak House. Suitable for use with the Bleak House campaign or the Mask of Red Death setting, this adventure is designed so that it can be played several times and no two experiences will be the same. Heroes, Monsters, and Settings, a 32-page book containing game statistics for some of Ravenloft's best-known yet never detailed villains, a new type of vampire, information on Marta Bay, Darkon, and maps intended for use with the Bleak House campaign. This is it, folks. This is, this is about as good as it gets right here. Bleak House. First thing you're going to notice, even though the cover still has the wrought iron gates and stuff, you're going to notice big change. No more rats, photocopied pictures of rats and skulls in the book. Okay? And the art has finally improved somewhat. Okay? That's the first thing you're going to notice about this. Um, the second thing about this adventure is it's epic in every sense of the word. So, I don't think I've mentioned, but let's go over the story of Dr. Rudolph Van Rich in the detail. He was just a little, he's a rich man from a wealthy family. And look at these maps. This map is pretty good. Okay. He comes from a wealthy family. He became a, a doctor, a quite successful doctor. He had a wife, a young son. One day, a gypsy named Madam Eva or Riva, no, it's not Eva, not Madam Eva, she's the gypsy that dealt with Strahd. Um, oh, dang it. Madam. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's not the assistant because Madam What's her what is her freaking name? Okay, um Madam Radinovich. Okay. Her son was entered and so she brought 
her son to Dr. Rudolph Van Richen. But unfortunately, Rudolph couldn't save him. He, uh, he died. Not because of any negligence of his part. The, he just couldn't fix. He couldn't help him. The, the kid was the. Her son was just too wounded. So what happened was she swore vengeance upon him, and so what she did was her and her troop went, kidnapped, her son, I mean his son, and sold his son to uh, this vampire named Baron Metis, who had a thing for young boys, I guess. Or something. He wanted a young son or whatever. Well, Van Richen uh, went to try to get his son back, and he did. He got his son back, and he found out his son was a vampire by that time, and so his son begged him to kill him, and so Van Richen killed his son and put him out of his misery. Baron Metis didn't take too kindly to that, so he went and he killed Van Richen's wife. At that point in time, Van Richen became uh, the legendary vampire killer he was, and he killed Baron Metis, and then he took vengeance upon Madame Radovich and her gypsy tribe and destroyed them, and then he became the famous uh, vamp uh, monster hunter that he was, and now when this adventure starts, he's sitting quietly, he's retired, he doesn't do really anything anymore, but he's got problems, he's starting to become crazy. So he uh, was sent to an insane asylum on the island of Dominia, the island of Terra Dominia, run by D D Dr. Dominia. Now, Dr. Dominia was all the way back in Feast of Goblins, and he was a vampire who fed on brain fluid. And I know it's a little different. Uh, you were supposed to, he was supposed to befriend you, he, you end up finding out he's a vampire, you kill him, but he's not really dead. He didn't die. But he was evil enough to eventually he got his own domain off the coast of the Sea of Sorrows or there. And he runs a, <clears throat> nobody knows he's really a vampire, he runs his famed uh, mental institution. It's supposed to get real good results and stuff like that. Uh, what he really does is he and his little underlings feed on the brain fluids of the people. He tortures them. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a hellscape, man. And, um... It plays a lot like The Prisoner, the old TV show, The Prisoner, and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and all that kind of stuff. So you go there to try to free or help Van Richen. Uh, you become prisoners of the insane asylum. You're forced to wear these, like, blank white masks. you got to figure out to find him and try to break out. But meanwhile, you're being tortured at night with all these cool little... He's trying to find out what your fears are. So if your fear of blood, he puts you in a room and fills it up with blood. Or you, your fear of electricity, he'll electric shock you and stuff like that. It is an awesome, awesome adventure. And you finally end up destroying him and freeing Rudolph and Richen. And then you go to um, uh, Darkon where... <coughs> Uh, Baron Metis has set up shop. He's pretending to be a wealthy philanthropist to help people. You go in his place and you help Van Richen destroy him. And all this time Van Richen is like on the brink of madness. I mean, he's he's on his last hill, man. He's... Whew. But it's not over there. Then Van Richen's ancestral home, Bleak House, is a haunted house that has been taken over by Madame... Radovich and her gypsies, but ghosts, their ghosts have taken over Bleak House, and anybody who's ever died there, his ghost is there is in Bleak House, and they still haunt the place. And you find out she was the one who brought Baron Metis back, and was behind the whole thing at the time to get revenge. And if you die in the house, you your ghost stays there. It's kind of like American Horror Story Murder House. Or hotel, uh, you die, or you go stay there, and you got to find some way um, to beat her and the ghost and all the cool hauntings that happen at that place while Van Richen goes slowly crazy. And then at the end, Van Richen he dies, or he's reborn as a little baby. You're not quite sure. The ending is left up to you and what you want to do. 
it is an epic adventure. It is so great, so filled with mood and terror. Like I said, it's considered one of the best box sets, one of the best adventures Ravenloft ever done. It arguably is the best. Um, and it is a, just a beloved jeweled product. There is so much information. It reads as like a, such a good story. It is a just a complete 180 from the Grim Harvest series, which had come out around the same time. <clears throat> and you can tell by the authors that work on it, uh, there are some good authors. Uh, Connors, Gross, and Steve Miller are wrote some of the best stuff for Ravenloft. And, you know, hey, it is fabulous. And this is a great thing because, you know, your characters can have the Van Richen guides in their possession. There's this legendary, you know, Van Helsing type character. You could have gone on adventures with him before, helped him out. And now you're seeing this legend fall from grace. And you're trying to do one last thing to save him. And you see him fall but you see him persevere in the face of evil and stuff like that. It is such an epic thing for your characters. And it has such an impact on the land of Ravenloft after he dies. A great, great thing. Cannot recommend this high enough. And that is the end of the main products for what I would like to call the Golden Era. But let's look at a few books that came out at that point in time. The Enemy Within, Christy Golden's third attempt. She wrote Vampire of the Mist and Dance of the Dead. And I thought Vampire of the Mist was okay. I didn't like Dance of the Dead. Sir Tristan Hiregard is a nobleman in the dark land of Nova Vassa. To all outward appearances, a kind lord who would never harm anyone. Yet Sir Tristan has a sinister secret, one that he does not even understand. At times, the nobleman transforms into the brutish creature named Malkin, a man beast who finds no act too base, just as long as it extends the killing grip of his vast criminal empire. No one is safe from Malkin, and it seems that no one can break his stranglehold on Nova Vassa until Tristan himself takes on a quest to destroy his evil side. Um, there's Tristan, there's Malkin. Malkin is the lord of Nova Vassa. This is basically Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. However, I do like this book. This book details Nova Vassa really well. It details Malkin and Tristan Hiregard's uh, relationship and, and all kinds of good stuff in it. I think this is her best book. And I I highly recommend it. It is a good tale, even though it's based on Dr. Uncle Mr. Hyde. But it's my favorite book from her, and I thoroughly enjoy it. Next, we have Mordenheim by Chet Williamson. And this is two young necromancers in training accept the, the invitation of Victor Mordenheim to aid him in his research. Mordenheim, man of science, wishes to revive his dead wife and funnel her essence into a new living receptacle. The newcomer's consternation is brought to a head when one of them, a lovely young woman, is kidnapped by Adam. Mordenheim's creation who swears to kill her should they pursue their plans. From then on, it's a race across the ice battling lycanthropes, ventral vistanti, and the dark forces themselves as the young necromancers try to escape the dark domains. This is a good book. I don't know why it doesn't get mentioned much, but it is a very good book. Now, you already know the history of, of Dr. Mordenheim and his Frankenstein creation, Adam, but this book tells it like half of it is from Dr. Mordenheim's point of view and the other half is from um, what happened I guess you could say that formed uh, the domain and, and, and the disappearance of Elsie and, or, and, or Mordenheim's wife or her death or comatose state and uh, all that kind of stuff is told in two halves uh, one half is from Mordenheim's point of view, and the other is from Adam's point of view. And basically the same events happen, but who the bad guy is depends on whose point of view you're reading it from. Adam, of course, makes himself sympathetic, and Mordenheim makes him sympathetic. So I think it's a good book. It fleshes out their history even more, and it actually has a pretty cool, neat little adventure. Uh, so another good book I like it Tales of Ravenloft <clears throat> from the dark domains and the files of Dr. Rudolph Enriching comes these new tales of terror featuring your favorite dark lords and ladies shudder at the sight of the headless horseman scream at the shrieks of the wailing banshee cry at the moonlit tacks of werebeasts 
Shape Shifting Berserkers, Manor Bound Ghosts, and even the Vampire Count Strahad von Zerovich. They're all here on tales taken straight from the Realm of Terror itself, Ravenloft. Okay, so this is basically short stories that um, occur in Ravenloft. And it's a, it's a mixed bag. Some of them are good, some of them aren't. Some of them um, deal with known people of Ravenloft. Some of them don't have anything to do with anybody in Ravenloft, but they put it in Ravenloft. Um, yeah, um, it just depends. I thought it was a mixed bag. It contained a new Von Zerovich story. I also had a new Lord Soth story. Um, and, you know, there are some really good stories in here, but there's some stinkers as well. So, a mixed bag. Like I said, half and half. Half are good, half are, half are not good. Um, I don't understand why they put new stuff in here that has not ever been mentioned in Ravenloft before in, in this thing, but okay. Um, yeah, it's alright. So the good is good, the bad is bad. What is considered now Death of a Dark Lord to be one of the worst books in the Ravenloft line. There's a plague in the village of Corden, a plague of the dead. Corpses walk the streets in search of the living. The villagers send for the mage finder Jonathan Ambrose, for they believe evil magic is at work. They are right. Jonathan soon discovers that it's Harkin Lucas who is behind the destruction of the town. Harkin Lucas has a plan for escaping the bounds of his realm. One of Jonathan's followers is just the person that Harkin Lucas needs. Jonathan believes he's in court to save the villagers to lay the dead to rest, but if Harkin Lucas escapes his curse and can travel the dark domains as he pleases, the slaughter has only begun. You want to know why this book is revered, reviled so much? It, it doesn't feel anything like a Ravenloft novel. Harkin Lucas is not really the Harkin Lucas you've met before in Feast of Goblins or what's described in the freaking rule books about him. Uh, Kartakius is, is not like it is in the modules you played it in. It's like this person didn't know a thing about Ravenloft, wrote a story about Ravenloft, and that's what we got. It really, I don't recommend it. Um, I mean, there are some good action scenes in this book, but for the most part, it just doesn't follow the Ravenloft lore and history, and it, it gets a lot wrong, so, yeah, Not that great of a book. King of the Dead is our next one here. With virtually unlimited powers as king of the dead, Aislinn still cannot find peace. Tortured by the death of his son, the unwilling ruler comes to despise the world of darkness and horror over which he reigns. From his previous life as a powerful wizard to his present unwanted status of king of the dead, this is the story of Aislinn's journey and his transformation. I like this book. It's a very good book. It's basically Aislinn's backstory, but in way more detail than is ever presented in any of the modules or source books. Uh, it's basically his version of I Strahide, except it should be called I Aislin, because it's it goes into detail about who he was before he was in Ravenloft, how he was, and all that kind of good stuff. And it's just a it's a it's a good book. Some of it, Jeannie Weiss's style takes some getting used to, uh, to be honest with you, but. Some of it is a little hard to read, but it's all right. Um, I enjoy it, and if you like Aislinn, I would I would definitely pick this up. Now there are a few other novels that came out before King of the Dead that I want to just touch on real quick. Um, I either totally skipped them for reasons I'll explain, or I had them and lost them, and they were either good or bad. The first one is Tapestry of Dark Stro Souls by Elaine Bergstrom. Now, Lane Bergstrom was basically a famous author, or somewhat famous author at this time. I guess Ravenloft people decided it was a real coup to get her to write a novel. And the novel was terrible. It was boring. It had really nothing to do with Ravenloft. It's like they paid her a bunch of money. Hey, you're a famous author. Uh, can you uh, write a Ravenloft novel for us? Sure. It's like she had no idea what Ravenloft was, and it was a bunch of people that had never been mentioned in Ravenloft before. Uh, they have no impact on any of the stuff that happened in Ravenloft later on. And hell, I am not even sure it was in Ravenloft. Skip it. It's terrible. Next up, we have Carnival of Fear by J. Robert King. Now, I, I, 
I wasn't a big fan of Heart of Midnight by J. Robert King, but this book is better than J. Uh, than Heart of Midnight. And it's basically about a carnival that is run by this cruel ringmaster type guy, and it's a freak show carnival. And you come to find out he's the reason that everybody's freaks. He made them like they are, and they rebel against him and kill him in the end and start running the carnival. Um, it really has nothing to do with Ravenloft. It, uh, it's, you know, it took place in this domain we'd never heard before and really never really <laughs> ever been mentioned except for a few other places here and then. And it just doesn't, just doesn't feel like a Ravenloft novel. Now, at the time, it, like I said, it had nothing to do. Now, it was retroactively, when the Carnival supplement came out later on uh, in Ravenloft, it was kind of, had that Carnival supplement had its roots supposedly based off that book. So that book was kind of retroactively fit in to make a connection to that supplement. But at the time, it really had nothing to do with Ravenloft. And um, it was an okay book. And so uh, I had it, but you know I lost it, and I don't care that I lost it. I'll be honest with you. But it's an okay book. Next up is Tower of Doom by Mark Anthony. Another skip it one. Uh, really has nothing to do with anybody from Ravenloft. I want to read these novels because I want to have a good story to flesh out about the lords and people I know who exist in Ravenloft, not some new stuff and some no-name domain that pops up and is never heard from again and that's why I want my novels to be like Night of the Black Rose, King of the Dead, stuff like that not something like Tower of Doom which is basically Hunchback of Notre Dame in the realm of Darkon uh, Aislinn does make a few brief appearances but other than that I mean it's I don't know, it's maybe average at best. It has no bearing on anything anywhere. It's just Hunchback of Notre Dame set in Darkon with a special guest appearance by Aislinn. And that's it. Baroness of Blood, another Lang Bernstrom book. Again, it's like she didn't know what the hell Ravenloft was, but they paid her a buttload of money to write a Ravenloft book. Did no research on Ravenloft. Characters you've never heard of before, places you've never heard of before. They've tried very hard to make this a part of Ravenloft, but other than the novel, it's never mentioned, and it's hardly ever mentioned again, and it's uh, another boring, hard-to-read book. Uh, again, that Tapestry of Dark Souls and The Baroness of Blood, I think I was actually pissed off after I read those. I was actually mad. I was like, damn, I can't believe I waste my money on this stuff. And last is Scholar of Decay by Tanya Huff. And actually, Scholar of Decay, I don't know why, how I lost it. I actually like that book. It's very good. It details the Lord of... It takes place in Richmond, And it deals with the Dark Lord of Richmond, Jacqueline Reiner, who is a were rat And Richmond is kind of based off of, uh, I don't know, 1700s France something like that. Uh, Jacqueline Reiner's a were-rat. The basically, were-rats run the domain and the human populace really doesn't have any idea. Um, she's cursed. Uh, unlike other were-rats who really don't fall in love or anything like that, she's cursed to fall in love. But the problem is when, she, when she's around the people she loves or the person she loves, because she's scared of being alone and stuff like that. When she's around the, the man she loves, she automatically turns into a were-rat. She can't control her transformation. So naturally, that repulses the man that she loves. So he wants nothing to do with her. Um, and her sister, Louise Reiner, who wants to be the Dark Lord of the Domain and wants the power, but it, they always are at each other a little bit, but they kind of sometimes love each other, but then they're at each other. And then all dealing with a guy who had a tragedy happen and is searching this dungeon for this artifact or something like that in the sewers and that the were rats it's a good book i enjoyed it it fleshes out the domain of rich Malot very well it fleshes out the dark lord that you know we have not had anything to do with rich Malot yet so i highly recommend that book and so that's it for my part two review of ravenloft the golden years um 
as you can see there were many supplements and modules that I absolutely love and adored the Van Richen guides there were a few missteps mainly the Grim Harvest the Red Box Forged of Darkness Chilling Tales but everything else even Light in the Belfry is a true gem and the Grim Harvest is not as total loss as people would like to think it is but the great stuff in this is great modules were coming out they were detailing lands and domains and the peoples of those domains that you had never seen before that you had never had the opportunity to experience before that had really had not been detailed so much um, stuff like the nightmare lands and bleak house the death of an epic hero it went out with a bang with that, with that. Uh, you know several you know good van Richen guides which I didn't think had were gonna be great turned out to be great um, I mean just almost one really uh, really almost with a few missteps one great product after another that truly was the golden age of Ravenloft so I will see you for my part three where Ravenloft really starts to decline but not in quality but in quantity until I will see you then.